Wow, now I can talk. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of Playthrough! Welcome, everybody, uh, to the show. Today's episode is uh, Radial Engines versus Rotary Engines, and this is quite the complex issue and there's there's lots of amazing uh youtube videos out there uh, that goes into the nitty gritty but this is plane savers and we keep things uh you know light and fun and speaking of light and fun uh i mean it's more arts and crafts uh we have a radial engine versus a rotary engine and let's learn the differences uh on this stuff and who better to go ask than chuck let's go see if we can find chuck i've never seen one work myself but as far as I know, the crankshaft is bolted to the airframe. So the whole motor turns like that. The whole thing. Whereas this one, just propeller. Not the whole motor. Right? This is the whole motor, man. Is that what it actually looks like? Yeah, that's it. That's it? So you find a motor yet? Oh, yes. So the one question, uh, the one thing we're talking about everything is, what engine to put on the aircraft? I, I think that's a pretty hard motor to operate, actually. you got to turn it off and turn it on. Do you know where the exhaust goes? No. It goes right out the top, all over the pilot. you got to be kidding. Yeah. Well, we better get this one, then. We can't have that. <laughs> you got to be kidding. Yeah, it's, it's a one-way oil system. So, just like a two-stroke, yeah. the oil goes in because it's spinning. Yeah. All the oil is thrown through the cylinder, yeah. out the top, so instead of you know like the exhaust like the dc3 yeah. you can see there's the exhaust everything comes out here away from the pilot here. this is squirting oil <laughs> yeah in real life this is squirting oil out. that's why world war one guys had the scarf oh my god you gotta be kidding isn't that crazy right wow it is so here i got uh, i did some stuff let's go look and see what it looks like inside the engines okay we got some fancy computer graphics folks and as we see here's the radial engine all the movement is inside the crankcase and inside the cylinders as the pistons go up and down moving the prop in a nice circular motion now let's head over to the rotary engine where because the engine is spinning the oil has nowhere to go except out it is being spun out of the engine as you can see if you zoom in uh the exhaust has really nowhere to go except straight out and this ends up right in the pilot's face <sighs> there's a lot of pros and cons for both so radial engine versus rotary engine let's start off with the rotary engine let's uh, do some pros and cons so the pros of the rotary uh it's error correct this is the engine that was on the aircraft or the engine type at least uh, in 1918 when this thing was being hand built uh by fokker uh, number two pro it's very cool it's a very cool engine there's not very many airplanes that you can actually install this type of engine on let alone see in the wild so imagine an engine a rotor engine spinning super 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 cool so the cons uh, it would be virtually impossible to get an actual uh, engine the actual engine because they're rare super super expensive now there is different uh, variants uh, speaking of engines, there's lots of noise outside. There is lots of variants out there. Um, but uh, so you would have to get an engine that isn't exactly like the original. So that, that's a con. Uh, the, another con is the operational uh, of the engine. You know, the engine is hard to operate. Um, like it doesn't have a starter. You're going to have to hand prop it. Uh, you know, the, it doesn't have a, a, a throttle really. You basically just shut the engine on and off to regulate the speed uh, i can go the, you could be a whole video on the operations of a, of a rotary engine uh, but just basically the operations of the engine uh, is the huge huge con so uh, not being able to find the real engine and uh, the operations are the, the big cons now the radial engine the radial engine so let's start off with the pro uh, very easy to find uh, radial engines uh, are everywhere uh, proven uh, and this aircraft had a radial, radial engine on it in fact a Jacobs 755 uh, which was already on this aircraft the pilots that flew this airplane have reached out and said it was a marvelous engine the airplane flew 
amazing with that engine. So that's a pro. Uh, the second thing is the you know feature comforts of something that is a little bit more modern, uh, meaning you have a starter. Uh, and uh, the reliability's up. Uh, you don't get the exhaust in your face like the other uh, uh, rotary engine. And um, parts are easy to find. Mechanics, everything is just a lot, uh, a lot easier. So to the cons, uh, it's not error correct. Uh, it, you're taking 1930s technology and putting it onto a 1918 airplane. So it's not error correct. Uh, and I guess really that's kind of the only con is that is that it's not error correct. There might be more, but that's kind of basically what we're talking about. But while we're here talking about radial engines, uh, one magnificent radial engine is the Pratt Winnie 1830. This is be is the, they're saying, is the most widely produced piston aircraft engine ever made. They've built over 173,000 of these engines. And the main reason, it's been on two of the, some of the most produced airplanes of all time. Yes, the DC-3. Do you know what the other one is? The B-24. Yeah, which is kind of funny because I don't even think there's that many B-24s, if any, flying right now. Uh, but this engine right here is a proven engine and uh, you can see it's just absolutely beautiful. So those are the things, you know, DTD, uh, the plane savers uh, we did last season, of course had the 1830s on it. Amazing, amazing engine. Uh, built in 1932 was the first time these airplane, uh, this engine actually started uh, for the first time. Uh, the, the aircraft design, I think it was 1935, December 17th, uh, was when the DC-3 first flew. So that's it. That's a quick, quick um, tidbit. Still is out here with the new dog, Jamie's new dog, Tinkerbell. So Tinkerbell's named after the C-46 down in the States. Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell, say hello. And say hello, Tinky. Oh, that's a good girl. So the big question is, what engine are we going to be putting on our Fokker DR1 project? And, and believe it or not, it has uh, actually a lot to do with the 73 Barracuda of mine that you might have seen in previous episodes in the background. Uh, what does a muscle car have to do with our project? And now bear with me for a sec. One of my most favorite movies uh, when it came out was the movie Gone in 60 Seconds. Now, uh, if you haven't seen this movie, it's about Nicolas Cage stealing 50 cars in one night. It's, it's crazy, it doesn't make any sense, but it's a wonderful movie. And there's a scene in the movie uh, of a Shelby Mustang. And so this Shelby Mustang, uh, it was called Eleanor. And when it was shown on screen for the first time, they had the music and it was amazing. I instantly fell in love with this car. The car was oh, amazing, amazing car. So I was like, I want a 67 Shelby GT500. That was the car, that's my dream car. Uh, now after doing some research, I realized that the car in the movie, even though they said it was a 67 Shelby GT500, was not. Uh, it was a heavily modified and actually only kind of resembled what a 67 Shelby GT500 car is. So if you were to get a 67 Shelby GT500, a real car, you wouldn't necessarily want to make it like the movie car because you would actually be depreciating its value. Uh, when these rare cars uh, are restored, the, the best way to do it is to bring it to how it was originally, what it came with out of the factory. That is what you should do because they're, they're pretty rare. Uh, we ran into this kind of scenario with DTD. Uh, DTD is a D-Day machine. Uh, other D-Day airplanes, uh, DC-3s, or C-47s around the world have been restored to the D-Day uh, specification. Well, we wanted to, um, you know, kind of do our own thing. So what does that actually have to do with anything? Um, this 73 Barracuda behind me here is a 318 car. It's, it's got a very small V8 in it. Uh, it's got an automatic transmission. It's a 73 uh, and it's pretty rough. So this car, if you were to store it to factory specs, would suck. <laughs> uh, but because it doesn't really have any value of what it was, you can make it whatever you want it to be. This car, you can put a Hemi in it. You can, you know, put tub it, put your transmission in it, you can put roll cages in it, you can make this car whatever you want because it isn't 
special. If this was a Hemikuda, uh, a numbers matching Hemikuda, you are required to make sure that the, the car is restored to original. You don't want to take a numbers matching Hemi and make it something weird. So going back to the Fokker, our Fokker is a replica. No Fokker DR1 survived past the Allied bombings in World War II. There was a couple that survived World War I, uh, but in museums in Germany, but after the bombings of World War II, they uh, unfortunately were destroyed. So there's no Fokkers left. So our Fokker, uh, which originally had the Jacobs 755 engine in it, uh, we can do whatever we want. It is, we're not bound to history. Yes, history would be very, very cool uh, to make it original, but no matter what we do, it will never be an original. Now, if if by miracle uh, we found a real DR1 somewhere, we would be bound by aviation law to make sure we restored it to absolute perfect condition and original, and we would. And uh, we wouldn't be putting no turbine on a real DR1. If you put that all together, uh, because of the DR1 being a replica, we can actually do whatever we want. Uh, and so I'm gonna, you know, side on the favor of you know usability and we're going to uh, put the Jacobs 755 engine on it and uh, I'll explain more why. So hopefully you guys understand the reasoning why we're going to be going with the Jacobs uh, 755 radial engine for all the for all the things that uh, we listed and most importantly uh, we want the Fokker DR1 to be a flyable airplane something that we hope to get to Oshkosh that's our whole goal is to get to Oshkosh uh, and something that, uh, you know, William will be able to fly. Uh, some cool news, uh, some of the pilots that uh, have flown this very aircraft, uh, she, this not even just the type, this aircraft, DRI, have reached out to me. Uh, so we have a list of possible test pilots. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we're gonna do it pretty good. And if you actually watched um, Peter Jackson's uh, airplanes, uh, I think uh, that Savage, uh, from Mistbusters, uh, Adam Savage. Uh, he went out there and uh, the DR1 that Peter Jackson has, so the famous Peter Jackson who did the uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and stuff, he's probably the number one World War I guy in the world. His DR1 radial engine has a starter, has a tail wheel, uh, a lot of little upgrades that make the airplane more flyable. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, I know that the decision's gonna upset a little, a few people, probably a lot of people, probably in the comments, but uh, yeah, we just bottom line is we wanna fly the airplane, we wanna make it usable. Uh, so yeah, this episode is taking me actually a couple days to do. Yeah, the work here at Buffalo's been crazy busy. I didn't get everything I wanted to in this episode, all the normal bonus plane savers material. So that's gonna be coming up uh, in the next episode, we got uh, some stuff with uh, the Tiger Moth project. Um, we got uh, a season one plane savers fan favorite uh, that's going to be sending us some videos, uh, which is really cool. So uh, hang on to that. Uh, that episode will be coming pretty soon. So thank you for joining me today. Hopefully you liked it. Hopefully you liked that little animation. Uh, it was pretty cool, pretty fun to make. Uh, yeah, so. We'll see you in the next one. You guys have a great night and uh, be safe out there. Bye.